Let's talk about cross guards, hand protection, and Asian versus European swords. Hey folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gully Tour. So I'm going to try and keep this as concise as possible, but I've, you will have noticed on the channel if you watch it regularly that I've done a number of um, comparison videos recently where I've compared and contrasted um, swords from Asia, swords from Europe, different periods, and also questioned whether how the people from each of those areas would use the other sword and would they use the other sword and why they're designed differently and things like this. So this is a massive, massive topic, but I want to specifically focus on handguards. So if we revert to two common types of sword which often come up in these weapon comparisons, uh, the katana, in this case no katana, actually a big one, um, and a bastard sword, a long sword. Um, and people, when they're comparing these two swords, and some, some people will go, oh, they're from different periods, they're from different places, they're from different places, but the design of the Japanese sword actually didn't change an awful lot for a very long time, um, going all the way back to the, what in Europe would have been the um, kind of Crusades era, I suppose, the Japanese sword for, through the Tachi, right the way through to the um, uh, Katana eventually, which most people are familiar with, doesn't change hugely uh, in design. Um, we'll talk more about Japanese swords in future videos, incidentally. There is more change in Europe, and obviously during that same period, we get a huge amount of evolution going on through um, these kind of migration era swords or Viking era swords, right the way through to cross hilted with long cross guard swords, uh, one handed swords, and obviously long swords and hand and a half swords as well. And then if we go into the 16th century, when the katana was in a sense kind of reached the form that most of, us, most of you are familiar with, uh, coming out of the earlier um, Uchi katana and uh, Tachi designs, coming into the more sort of classically uh, what's in most people's mind the shape of a katana. Um, of course, by that point in Europe, we've got complex hilted swords. But if we look in some parts of Asia, not all, because uh, we don't want to generalise, um, we see that in some places swords didn't change as much as they did in Europe. In some places they did, it has to be said, um, in India, for example, in India there was a lot of uh, a lot of change in sword design from the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. And in fact, most of what you think of as sort of typical Indian swords, most of them are from the 16th century and afterwards. And in fact, the kind of medieval, if we use that kind of European historical uh, frame set, uh, most of the medieval Indian swords are actually quite difficult. They're forms of Kanda, basically, and, and uh, another sword as well. But they're not the forms that most of you will have be most familiar with. Now, cross guards. So, when people, sorry, I picked that back up again. When people are comparing these two swords, one of the points that people always bring up, because they like, most people strip these out of their due context, and there's the word if you're waiting for it, um, is hand protection. Okay, now the point I've made in previous videos, I think numerous times, is yes, the cross guard enables you to do certain things. It does provide a fair amount of hand protection in certain ways and in certain actions, um, and from certain types of... Uh, you know, the blade sliding down the, the other blade and um, certain types of bind, wind and things like this. Um, it does provide some hand protection. However, it's not a huge amount. Um, and we have to concede that some of the actions that the cross guard protects you against, the disc guard or suba found on a Japanese sword, or indeed the comparative disc guard found on Chinese swords, Korean swords, Mongolian swords, and various other swords, um, that type of disc guard does provide uh, some protection as well, uh, obviously back to front, but also side to side. And it has to be noted, this type of um, disc guard, which goes all the way back to, um, well, I'm actually not sure when they first appeared. There's a good topic for, uh, for another video, but they were certain, certainly around uh, by the sort of uh, 10th, 11th century. Um, they actually provide more protection certainly than the kind of Viking era short cross guard. And this is the point I wanted to make, is actually if we look at Chinese swords, so here we've got LK Chen's um, Tang Heng Dao, um, and actually in some ways it's not so different, and these are from the same era. So people I think have this perception, because they're looking at 16th century swords some of the time, that they think, oh European swords lots of hand protection, Asian swords, not lots of hand protection. And that's actually kind of wrong. First of all, there's a lot of variation in Asia. Asia is a very, very large continent, but even if we just limit this to say, Chinese and Japanese swords and Korean, um, th because those are interrelated swords, that's why I picked those out, um, then there are different types of swords, 
uh, at any one given period. And even within a certain type of sword, some of them have more hand protection, some of them have less hand protection. But the headline that I really want to uh, outline here is that certainly in this period, in, the, in what in Europe was the Viking era, actually there isn't really a very big uh, difference in hand protection. And you'll see that both of these have cross guards that project slightly out from the grip and slightly out from the blade. If we go back to earlier periods, if we go back to you know Z uh, one one AD or one BC, um, then uh, essentially so two thousand ish years ago, then essentially at that point, whether you're looking at Europe or China um, or anywhere else, um, most swords don't really have any hand protection to speak of. Yeah, there's a few rare exceptions in the ancient world, like the falcata, that sometimes have some degree of extra hand protection, but mostly if we're looking at, say, the Roman um, Spartha and we're looking at the um, Chinese Jian, then neither of them have very much hand protection. The hand protection that's there is mostly to protect your hand from going up onto the blade. And these do provide some amount, if there is another blade in contact and it slides down, it will stop there. Um, however, if it collides with the blade and bounces off, which does happen with steel blades, if it bounces off and it comes down, it's likely to hit you in the hand. But both of these swords were very often used with shields, of course. And if you've got a big shield in one hand, then that's providing most of the protection to your sword hand. And it's, it's guarding the line to your weapon hand. But there's another point, and this is something I've made a whole video about, I think, years ago. I probably need to refresh. What the relative merits of your weapon are only relative really to the weapon that your opponent is using. So if everybody is using a, a, a Tang Dynasty Dao or everyone's using a Katana with the same type of hand protection, you're not at a disadvantage to anyone because they've got the same amount of hand protection. So, you know, bear that in mind. It's only when you know, evolution of technology or evolution of many kinds only really happens when there's a pressure that forces it to happen. In other words, in weapons where the opponents you're fighting against have a better kind of thing and start to kick your butt with that thing, you think, I need that thing. Okay, so it's only when that set of people get basket hilts that you think, mm, we need basket hilts, or when that group of people get firearms. If we look at the Maori Wars, for example, the land wars in New Zealand, then you need firearms. The Maoris were perfectly happy killing each other for hundreds of years with the weapons they had, but as soon as Europeans brought firearms into New Zealand, then everybody needs firearms to fight the other people with firearms. So it's an escalation, basically. And I kind of see hand protection a little bit like that. But also, and this links to other points I've made in videos, when you're looking at a battle sword rather than a dueling sword, the context is very, very different. And when you're thinking about someone fighting in war, what, you know, think of some other primary hand weapons used in war. Axes, spears, maces, do these have hand protection? No! And yet they're very successful battlefield weapons. They might not be um, optimised for dueling, and um, indeed, uh, it's a bit different with spear because spear is kind of only a thrusting weapon. But if you look at something more like maybe a, um, a glaive or um, a, a bill or a halberd, you can use them in one-on-one -on -one combat and neither person has really got any hand protection. Your hand protection is provided by you not putting your hands in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and also bear in mind that, yeah, oh, you might get hit in the hand and it might, you know, wound you. It might incapacitate you. Yeah, you might get hit in the head and it might incapacitate you or wound you. If it's a halberd, that's definitely going to be the case. It doesn't really matter whether you're wearing a helmet or not. If someone hits you in the head hard with a halberd in the helmet, you're probably going down. There's some good videos from Battle of the Nations on YouTube about that. So, there are many, many things to unpack here. But one of the things I really want you to go away from this video kind of with being kind of reinforced or, or, or highlighted is the fact that certainly if we're looking at Europe versus China or even Japan, in what we would call the Viking era in Europe, there isn't really much, big, much difference in hand protection. But interestingly, there is variation within swords. And many of you will know that in the late Viking era and the um, kind of into the Norman period, we start to get longer hand guards. Now, interestingly, whilst disc guards became very prevalent in China, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, um, while disc guards became very popular in that sort of sphere, um, in, uh, at the time when cross guards were popular in Europe, 
there were also cross guards in in Asia, and of course we find cross guards on um, on Indian swords um, quite commonly. Uh, but also, what I think not everyone's that aware of is the fact that you do get longer cross guards on some. Chinese swords. Now this is actually um, from the same era, it's a Tang Dynasty, it's just a slightly different design, it's a Tang Dynasty uh, Dao. Okay, so this is the palatial Tang Dao on LK Chen's website and um, you can see it's got a longer cross guard. Now, is that longer cross guard there for looks? Is it there to protect the hand? I, I would say it's for added hand protection, yes. Um, does it provide extra protection? Yeah, absolutely. It projects a little bit further out over the knuckles and importantly if you're fighting with uh, shield and swords, sorry I just put that sword um, loop around my wrist so it doesn't keep flapping around, if you're fighting with sword and shield um, interestingly one of the things that sometimes happens and if you've ever fought with sword and shield you will have uh, encountered this is very often when you're trying to hit a person they'll put their shield in the way because that's what shields are for. Now what's interesting is if, you're, if you don't have time to redirect or do something else with the sword to come around there and if they catch you at the right moment, what often ends up happening is your hand collides with the shield. Now what's interesting is lots of swords that have minimal or short hand guards, they do nevertheless have just enough hand guard to mean that you don't smash your fist full force into someone else's shield. Um, so I would argue that this type of guard, by projecting a little bit further, does not only provide some protection against an opponent's weapon, uh, but uh, oh, and, and there's one other thing I mentioned in a second as well, um, but also provides added protection against colliding your fist into their shield. And remember, most of the people using certainly these swords wouldn't have had uh, hand protection most of the time. They just would have had bare hands, maybe gloves uh, sometimes, but from what we can see in the art and stuff it looks like bare hands. So they, they were wearing armour in war, they were wearing helmets and cuirasses of various sort, lamella and stuff like this, but um, they didn't have gauntlets or anything similar to that for the most part. Uh, there may be some exceptions, but generally speaking. The other thing I was going to mention that cross guards have in, so we alluded to this, well I mentioned it in fact, in regards to the medieval sword and that is binding against an opponent's weapon. Now a very interesting feature of the cross guard specifically, and not something that you can do particularly easily with the disc guard that you find on um, later Dao or indeed the Japanese sword, um, is if you've got enough of a cross guard there, you can actually, when you're defending yourself against a spear user, uh, run up the person's blade uh, and let it catch on there more easily than you can do if you don't have enough of a projection of a guard. And if we go to the other Tang Dynasty Dao here, there's not really enough projection on that one to form any, you can form a bit, but not a very secure bind against a, a person's pole weapon, a spear for example. Uh, whereas with the longer cross guard you can. Um, so, uh, the other thing to mention, right, then, so no, this is very important. So we've seen that some Chinese swords do have a cross guard. Now, what's interesting is, if we go later in time, say to the Ming Dynasty, and you look at Ming Dynasty artworks, and we're now talking of, of kind of the period of long swords in Europe and the, the typical medieval cross-hilted swords that you're familiar with from this channel and many others. When we go into this era, uh, we actually find that not only do you have disc guards on some swords in China, but you also have quite long cross guards. And actually they don't look dissimilar. The, the um, type of jian that's worn in the, uh, in the sort of Ming Dynasty and in the medieval period in Europe, uh, the type of typical kind of courtier's arming sword practically looks almost like a medieval sword some of the time, not always, but it has can have quite a long cross guard on it. So don't always think European swords lots of hand protection, Asian swords not lots of hand protection. And the other thing I would say as well is um, remember also that these disc guards, while they might not project out in this plane as far and give as much protection to the hands in the sense that a medieval European cross guard does, they project sideways more than a European cross guard does. And so they can provide, certainly in the plane of the flat of the blade, they can provide more protection. Now, why? <laughs> why disc guards were so popular in quite a lot of Asia and cross guards were so popular in Europe? 
uh, is something I have tackled in previous videos, but a long, long time ago, and I definitely think it's worth revisiting. Uh, maybe there's more action with the edge in Europe, maybe not, I don't know. I don't think that that's the case, but um, what is interesting is when we start to see added protection on European uh, cross guards, we start to see one of the first things that gets added in the 16th century and actually at the end of the 15th century are side rings. And side rings give a similar kind of degree of protection to a large disc guard. And the other thing to mention as well, uh, most people are familiar with specific types of Asian sword with disc guard, uh, particularly with late 19th century and early 20th century Chinese Dao, which have a very characteristic set of designs, or there are a set of characteristic designs. Um, and also they're familiar with the kind of 16th century and after style of Japanese sword. Now what's interesting is some Chinese swords and some Japanese swords and some Korean swords actually have larger disc guards than maybe you're used to seeing. So if you look at earlier period um, Japanese suba, for example, if we look at 12th, 13th, 14th century suba to be fitted onto tashi and nodashi and stuff, some of them can be really quite large, larger suba than you're used to seeing on these sorts of replicas, which are really a later period style of suba for the most part. Um, and equally on Chinese swords, we see a big variation in the size of the discards on them. And some of those discards actually offer quite a lot of protection. And when you look from the side, they project as far out were further out than uh, the most Viking era swords, in fact, um, and they project as far out as some later arming swords. So I hope that gives you some food for thought. Obviously, I'll do more specific uh, videos about some of the things I've touched on in this video in the future, looking at different types of cross guard found on various types of Jian and Dao in China, looking at uh, I promise you I'm going to be doing more videos about Japanese swords as well, doing lots of reading at the moment in preparation for things I'm working on. Um, uh, and we will also do some more comparative videos in the future as well, but where we compare maybe less famous, less known weapons from uh, different parts of Asia, different parts of Europe and beyond maybe. Anyway, uh, your thoughts and contributions always welcome below. Uh, enjoy the chat. I hope we get some interesting things come up there as always. If you've got interesting points to make, that might feed future videos uh, and interesting questions as well, related to this or related to anything else. Uh, again, that might lead to future videos. And uh, I will see you soon, um, either here or on Patreon, where I do extra videos as well, three a month. And I will see you soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.